Welcome. Uh, my name is Joe Capizzi. I am the uh, Executive Director of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America, where I've also had the privilege of being a professor of theology for more than 20 years. Um, I run the Institute, which itself is committed to um, sort of projecting the fullness of Catholic social doctrine into our culture. And it does so largely by bringing together academics and researchers and people interested in the life of the church. Tonight, we're pleased to have with us an old friend of ours, somebody who's been good to the Institute and to Catholic University of America for a long time. And of course, that's George Weigel, who is uh, one of the leading Catholic commentators on politics and the church and has been for well over three decades. George is the author of dozens of books, including his famous Witness to Hope, which is an award-winning biography of Pope John Paul II. He's also been a keen analyst of American political and ecclesial politics. And he's a currently the Distinguished Senior Fellow and Chair of Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC. To put it um, most concisely, only George could, could have written a book like his latest one, um, The Next Pope which I had the pleasure of reading over the past week. Um, nobody has paid more attention to the papacy from an American perspective than George has over the past quarter of a century. He's been close friends and a close colleague of the, the past uh, popes, Pope Benedict, Pope uh, Francis, and Pope John Paul II. He's studied um, these things from uh, a variety of perspectives. He's looked at church doctrine for a long time, some of his books, have engaged church doc doctrine deeply. These experience he brings together in this book to lay out a kind of strategy and project for um, the papacy as it heads into the middle of the 21st century. I'm gonna stand aside right now and allow George to give us a sense of what he does in that book. And then he and I will open up um, a conversation between the two of us, after which I invite you to uh, engage that conversation by posting your questions through the chat box. We will uh, allow about 20 minutes for those questions from you. Um, and then we will conclude our conversation. So again, it's my pleasure to turn this over to George. George, thank you for joining us. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Joe, to you and all of your colleagues at, at the Institute for Human Ecology at, at Catholic University. The, the Institute is really one of the great initiatives in Catholic higher education uh, today. Uh, the very idea of human ecology of a human ecology uh, is, is a product of the social doctrine of the three popes whom I've had the privilege of knowing, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis. So we're, we're right in the sweet spot here to be talking about the future of the papacy and the future of the church under your auspices. Thank you. I wrote, um, let me hold this up, uh, the next pope, the Office of Peter and a Church in Mission, um, to try to elevate the conversation about the future of the church and, and the future of the papacy. This conversation is too often conducted today in tweets and snarky Facebook postings and other frankly silly forms of attempted conversation. Uh, and I thought it was time to try to elevate that uh, a bit. Uh, I've had the grace, the privilege of, of a distinctive experience over the past uh, three decades uh, of knowing Pope John Paul II very well, of collaborating with him on a number of projects, and, and then of, of being his uh, biographer. Uh, Pope Benedict, I actually have known longer than I knew John Paul II. I've known Benedict for 32 years now. We had a remarkably robust conversation in Rome last October. And I first met Pope Francis in Buenos Aires in May 2012 uh, and have met with him uh, three times in, in the Vatican uh, at his uh, invitation uh, since then. So this is a distinctive experience and I thought that experience created a responsibility. Let's think about the future of the church through the prism of this unique Catholic institution uh, called the papacy. So the questions I pose in this rather short book, 140 pages, 
uh, goes down easily, I hope. Uh, the questions I pose are, you know, first of all, what's it important for the Pope and the Church to understand about the Catholic situation in the world today? Uh, and I mean that primarily in terms of the cultural situation and how does, how does the Church effectively proclaim the Gospel under these circumstances? Now, secondly, what, is, what should the Pope and the Church understand about recent Catholic history. There's a lot of uh, controversy about this uh, right now. Uh, I have some things to say about how the church came to where it is today uh, since uh, the mid 19th century. Uh, and I hope that provides everyone uh, something to reflect about. And then, then the book talks about um, the papacy and the ongoing reform of the church the reform of the episcopate, the bishops, the reform of the priesthood and consecrated life, the encouragement of lay apostolates throughout the church, um, the reform of the Vatican, uh, which I think is a major uh, imperative for the next uh, pontificate. Uh, and then I talk about uh, some things odd extra, if you will, uh, the next pope and ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, and the next pope in world politics. Um, this is an agenda for the whole church. It's not just about what the pope should do, uh, but it is very much focused on the papacy because the papacy is a unique office. It has unique initiating powers uh, in the church, and yet those initiating powers uh, are intended to be empowering powers. Now, the Pope is not a czar. The Pope is not an autocrat. The Pope is the servant of a tradition, not its master. Uh, and the Pope's fundamental obligation, as I understand it, uh, is to take seriously uh, Luke twenty-two thirty-two, when the Lord says to Peter, and you, Peter, must turn and, and strengthen your brethren strengthen your brethren. So how does the Pope do that with respect to the different states of life in the church and the different apostles in the church? So that's an overview of the book. It has nothing to do with conclave politics. There is no discussion of future popes. Uh, this is an agenda for the future. And as I say, I really hope it, it elevates uh, the conversation out of the somewhat unhappy uh, conditions in which too much debate goes on in the church today. Sure, sure. Um, I, I hope so too, right? I think we both um, recognize that there's uh, just a fatigue, right, among many people with regard to what's happening and the kind of contentiousness and the hot taking and so on um, within the church. But let's, let's just begin um, kind of where you ended, uh, George, and that is on um, the reform of the papacy itself, right? You, you used at one, term, at one point in the book the term papal protagonism, right? And perhaps um, it would be helpful to those who are listening for you to describe that. And in, in, in describing papal protagonism, which, which you sort of introduce as a kind of problem, right, to be, to be dealt with, can you give us a sense of how you think that developed? Like, you know, because again, you've, you know, you've been paying attention to this in a way a lot of people have not. So papal protagonism, what's the problem there? I think we have to roll the uh, historical clock back uh, a couple of hundred years and begin with this premise, which I can't prove, but I think is true. Uh, when the Catholic Church was formally erected as the Diocese of Baltimore uh, in the United States uh, in the early 1700s, there were maybe 40,000 Catholics in the 13 original states. I would be astounded if more than 5% of them could have answered the question, who is the Pope? Answer, of course, would have been Pope Pius VI. But the sure. point is that the papacy and the Pope was simply not that big a part of the daily Catholic imagination. And because, of course, Mass was celebrated in Latin, which most people didn't understand, 
the reference to the Pope in the Roman canon would have gone right over people's heads. This begins to change in the mid 19th century. Pius IX, who was Pope for 32 years, 1846 to 1878, was the first Pope whom Catholics had a picture of right. in their homes. I mean, he became the first Pope in the modern sense that we understand the papacy as occupying a central position uh, in, in the Catholic imagination. And this has intensified ever since then, not least because when you've got a complex global entity like the Catholic Church, and you've got a media, a communications media, trying to figure this thing out, it helps to have a single reference point. So, you know, and then the fact that you had for 26 and a half years this incredibly compelling public personality in John Paul II. Right. Someone who managed to hold the world's attention longer than Ronald Reagan, longer than Margaret Thatcher, longer than Helmut Kohl. I mean, he kept people's attention for over a quarter of a century. Um, this has led to a situation where in the media mind and in, in many Catholic minds, the Pope is the Catholic Church. And this is just not right. I mean, the Pope is certainly a crucial uh, member right. of the Catholic Church. The papacy <clears throat> is a crucial part of the Catholic Church, but you cannot reduce the Catholic Church to the papacy because you miss all of the other stuff that's going on among what is now a community of 1.3 billion people. Uh, there's another problem with this, and I, and I describe this a bit in the book and have been concerned about it for some time. When you had, this, this became clear to me even before I got the idea of writing John Paul II's biography. When you have a strong central figure like John Paul II, uh, local authorities, local bishops, can sometimes decide, I don't have to deal with this problem, even though I should deal with this problem. They'll deal with it in Rome. That's a default of authority at the local church level. Uh, and that's a temptation, I'm afraid, into which too many local bishops fell uh, over the quarter century of John Paul II. And so uh, one of the points I make in the next pope is that the next pope <laughs> has to really make it clear to the bishops of the church that they are not the branch managers of RC, Roman Catholic Church, Inc., uh, simply executing or orders from, from the CEO at headquarters. The Pope is not Jeff Bezos and, uh, uh, or the head of General Motors or, or whatever. The, the, these right. bad right. local bishops are real vicars of Christ in their own dioceses. Right. But that's, that's a part of the problem of, of papal protagonism. The other problem, I think, is this sense that many people have, uh, and, and that I think Pope Francis has, has tried to address in, in his own distinctive way, that, that lay Catholics need permission to take evangelical initiatives, to be missionary yeah. disciples. And they don't. You were baptized. For this. Um, and the notion that you have to wait until you get some sort of permission slip from, from the headquarters in order to be the missionary disciple you were baptized to be, this is another, another problem here. So there are a number of facets to this. It's good for the church that there is a central figure who can speak for this complex, diverse 1.3 billion member community. Papacy has a unique moral authority in the world, as you and I have discussed on, on many occasions. Um, but there's a downside to this, and I think, you know, it's, it's almost 100, well, it is 150 years since Pius IX, and uh, I think it's time we start talking about this and thinking how the Pope is, the, is a protagonist in a way that empowers others. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and, and one, one other sort of downside of this that just struck me is, is the potential that certain kinds of personalities will become more valued as potential popes than others. And, and um, 
you can't help but think of the difference in personality between a Ratzinger um, and a John Paul II or a Francis, right? You would, again, know this better than anybody, but certain sorts of introverted personalities might not be sort of transparently the obvious guy if you're really wedded to a protagonist model where they might actually be pastorally or in other respects, the, you know, the most apt person, right, for the, you know, for the, for the role. I, I was struck by this when I saw Pope Benedict, Pope Emeritus Benedict, uh, last October, and we spent 45 minutes in a very robust conversation. I mean, he's very frail physically, but clear as a bell, right. right. and utterly lucid as, as always. And I thought to myself, you know, what a tragedy this was, that beginning on the day of his election, a lot of the world media decided this is a boring guy. Right. And, and so we're just not going to pay a lot of attention. Um, and then, you know, as, as you know, he gives these remarkable September lectures in Regensburg, in Paris, in London, in, in Berlin, where he acutely diagnoses the contemporary cultural crisis of the West and its influence on, on democracy, and nobody's paying any attention. It's like pulling teeth to get my media friends to pay any attention to this. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, but it, but, it, but it, it is boring if your measure is the hot take, right? I mean, he's busy, yeah. making, dis he's busy making distinctions and being nuanced, and by comparison, right, he's, you know, if the hot take is by definition exciting, Pope Benedict by that measure was born. But but if you paid attention, right, you 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 were right startled and exhilarated, right? And maybe angered at times, right? But there was argument there, you know? Right? And, and that's yeah, that's well, a real it, it's interesting that this guy who's thought to be some sort of a you know the greatest mind of the ninth century or whatever. Uh, right. and it was the Pope who, who got a Twitter account. <laughs> and um uh, sent out the first papal tweet. And, right, and the right. guy who was then in charge of the Latin section and the Vatican Secretary of State uh, is a friend of mine. And I, I, I sent him an email. I said, are you people out of your minds? Uh, this is the most, arguably the most learned man in the world. And you're reducing him to 140 characters. <laughs> right, right. And this guy wrote back after several months. He said, you know who loves this stuff? Latin teachers in high school. So <laughs> somehow um, Benedict's Latin tweets were uh, becoming uh, material for high school translation exercises. Um, I, I think there is, well, there are two things to say. First is Vatican communication strategy needs a major review leading to a major overhaul. Um, you'll remember that our father, our friend, the late father Richard John Newhouse, mm -hmm. used to say the church should only speak when the church must speak. And if the church doesn't have to speak, it shouldn't speak. It should leave it to the yeah. Lay data figure things out and, and, and do what they're supposed to do. I would say this applies to the papacy. Um, the Pope should only speak, for example, about issues of public policy, uh, world politics, economic matters, etc., when the Pope has to speak. Right. Uh, and, and even in those circumstances, that should be in terms of framework setting and, and whatnot. Um, because it just overloads the circuits after a while. Yeah, yeah. I think this has been a problem with this pontificate. Uh, you'll notice that these papal press conferences on Pope Francis's return from his overseas pilgrimages are getting less and less attention, mm -hmm. less and mm -hmm. less media attention, even in the Catholic media sure. and blogosphere. And this is, this is just overloading the circuit. So you need to say, they need to think about that. Um, and I think they also, uh, the next Pope needs to think about the modalities of, of papal communications. 
Um, we're going to get a new encyclical on October 4th on human fraternity. Uh, my old friend, the late Cardinal John Foley, used to urge uh, when he was head of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications that whenever an encyclical was, reach, uh, was released, there would be a two-page set of bullet points because you just, if you imagine that the world media is going to read the whole thing, you're, you're simply living in fantasy land. So let's get out the key points we want to make. So we're framing the story. We're being proactive. Yeah. Uh, no one's ever learned that lesson in life. Um, so uh, there's a lot to be done here. It is a communications-driven world. Um, it's important that the Pope be a good communicator, but the way that happens and how often it happens, I think, needs some re-examination. Yeah. Let, let's shift gears a little bit now in terms and go back to the book. Um, one of... Uh, the projects that you lay out for the next Pope is going to come as no surprise to your readers, um, and that is continuing the new evangelization. Um, I mean, one way to sum this up would be uh, to continue to evangelize those who already call themselves Christians. Um, it's not merely to sort of reach out to those um, who are not in the Christian fold, but actually to deepen um, the, the commitment of those who are already Christians. Do you see that um, the church over the past, you know, two or three papacies has begun to lay out that kind of trajectory in a way that gives you optimism, that it, it sees that as, you know, kind of, you know, a need and is beginning to track, you know, some, some positive ways forward for that? As you know from the book, uh, Joe, one of its, uh, one of the fundamental points of reference in the book is is my claim that if you if you look around the world church today, um, and, and at, if you if you look at the living parts of the world church, today, whether we're talking about parishes or dioceses or religious communities or universities or uh, seminaries or lay apostolates. Uh, the living parts of the world church, and I think this is true across the globe. This is not simply an American phenomenon. Yeah. The living parts of the world church are the parts that have embraced the Second Vatican Council as authoritatively interpreted by John Paul II and Benedict XVI and have adopted this idea of the new evangelization as the grand strategy for the future. Everyone is a missionary disciple, as Pope Francis says. Uh, the church is permanently in mission and every place is mission territory. The dying parts of the world church or the moribund parts of the world church are either the parts that haven't figured this out yet and are still counting on kind of old ethnic or tribal transmission belts to pass the faith along to the next generation, or they're the parts of the church that are still trying to make uh, what I've been calling Catholic light um, work and Catholic light never works. Uh, there's no place in the world where the dumbing down of Catholic uh, right. doctrine and, and practice has, has led to a vital church. And <clears throat> I'm afraid in this book, the next Pope, I've extended the Coca Cola metaphor and uh, have written that Catholic light inevitably leads to Catholic zero. Um, <laughs> which is very difficult to translate into the various languages the book is going into, but I'm sorry. Um, so, if, yeah, you, sure. if you understand that, then, you know, one essential task for the Pope is to encourage the living parts to continue along that path and to try somehow to jolt the moribund or dying parts or inspire them into uh, a sense of, of missionary and evangelical possibility. Uh, this is very difficult in some circumstances. On the other hand, who would have expected 50 years ago that the, the tremendous growth area for the Catholic Church in the world would be sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah. That the most dynamic 
vital, evangelically vibrant part of Catholicism would be south of the Sahara Desert. Uh, so uh, things can be made to happen when, when people take this evangelical responsibility seriously. Yeah. So let me follow this up a little bit and return us to the states. Um, you're aware, um, as I am, that, that, that among those who are evangelically Catholic, uh, right, who are committing themselves to a certain kind of depth to their faith, are those who reject, um, to put it bluntly, your project, right, or, or Richard John Newhouse's project, right, or a project that they see as accommodating uh, um, the faith to uh, the, the, the goods associated with liberal democracy, right? How, how, how would you fit them into your analysis? Do you see them as, in, in some way, a kind of apt response to the cultural problems around themselves or a misreading of um, some of these problems? Do you get the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I would remind people that my second book, <laughs> way back in 1989, uh, was called Catholicism and the Renewal of American Democracy. Mm -hmm. And right. it, the, the clear premise is, you know, things are not going the way they should. Here's how Catholic social doctrine can, can help fix it. So the notion that I have advanced a project of accommodation is just simply wrong. I mean, you cannot read what I have published over the last 30 years and rationally come up with that explanation. I mean, my Simon lecture here in Washington two years ago was a call for a new great awakening in, in the United States because our political mm -hmm. culture was, was falling apart, uh, which unfortunately I was uh, too right uh, in, in observing that. Richard's last book was called American Babylon. Um, you know, Christians are always in exile. We're always strangers in a strange land. So first of all, I just think the charge is not uh, a sensible one. Um, in, in more recent uh, years, uh, the argument has been about, has the American, was the American founding essentially flawed? Right, right. From the get-go, uh, were these problems we're experiencing today built into the, the conceptual underpinnings of, of American democracy? Um, some very intelligent people believe that. I don't. Uh, I think it is it is simply ahistorical to say there is a direct line from the Declaration of Independence to Obergefell versus Hodges, the gay marriage decision of the Supreme Court, or to uh, the, the uh, recent decision on uh, LGBT uh, labor rights. Uh, there is a very complex history really beginning in the 1940s that explains all of this. Um, Father John Courtney Murray, while not explicitly citing gay marriage or LGBT <laughs> agitations, which no one could imagine in 1960, nonetheless warned about the erosion right. of the moral political foundations of the United States by, by means of pragmatism and utilitarianism. Right. Uh, a collapse of the old natural law consensus. Uh, so uh, I don't buy the, you know, the notion that the, the, this was all, uh, we're, we're doomed from the get-go. I just don't buy it. I do think the situation is now critical in a way that I could not have anticipated uh, 30 years ago. The, the situation in the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I have been, as you know, an advocate for, you know, a natural law approach to moral reasoning. There are truths built into the world and into us. These can provide a grammar for ordering a conversation mm -hmm. about uh, the public good f among people of different religious convictions or no religious conviction. Uh, that's getting harder and harder to argue. 
it's very hard or hard to argue about a natural moral law when there's no human nature, which is sure. what the recent Supreme Court decision uh, seemed to indicate. Um, so I, I think we're all scrambling uh, to find uh, a language, uh, a grammar, if you will, uh, so that this is not simply pure power politics or tweets or Facebook barrages or, or whatever, but it's not easy. It's, right. uh, it's not easy. Uh, I think there is still enough left in most of the country of, of a sense that there really are some truths built into the human condition that we can know by, by careful reflection. Um, and that these truths disclose duties, both personal and, and public. But I think we are waiting, hopefully not for Godot, but we're waiting for a public figure with the capacity to draw those out and then, and then apply them. And um, that person is not quite visible right now. Well, it seems as well that part of what you're describing both in this book and you've done in a couple of other books um, is that the church provides that kind of grammar, right? The, per the church, in fact, has some elements of the grammar that is necessary for this kind of conversation that will uh, esteem um, our culture uh, in a way that it, you know, it's currently not. Uh, and, and that even the description of you know, the, the diminishing of papal protagonism in favor of also a kind of more robust lay into, in, you know, activity um, is an aspect of, of all of this, right? That this cultural transformation that can produce a public figure who's capable of employing a grammar, in fact, depends in, to some extent on the church doing her job yeah. really well, right? Um, yeah, so, I, 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 yeah, go on, please. Well, let, let me just throw a thought in there. Yeah. Um, you know, we both uh, committed ourselves a long time ago to the life of the mind and its application to public policy. Um, I do think it's important for people like us to realize that, that finally the world does not change by rational argument, at least by rational argument alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we won the argument on the abortion license 30 years ago. I mean, it, it, there is no scientific reason to deny, and there is every scientific reason to affirm, that the product of human conception is a human being. It's not something else. This is elementary genetics. It's taught in high school. So the science, to use the phrase of the day, we won that one. It doesn't take a whole lot of... Uh, work to figure out that an elementary principle of justice is that a just society owes the protection of the laws to innocent human beings. That, that, that's not hard to figure out. Right. Um, so, okay, we got the two pieces of the puzzle. We've got the factual piece and we've got the, you know, the ethical piece. So why are we still losing because we have not done for the unborn what was successfully done uh, from, I would say, the early 1950s to the mid-1960s in the matter of Jim Crow uh, and the removal of uh, segregation laws from our statute books. We have not changed enough hearts, and we haven't given enough spine or put enough spine in, into political leaders. Now, there's a whole nother argument about what's going on, going on in the Supreme Court and its crazy sure. notions of the nature sure. of freedom and, and all the rest of that. But um, yes, the church has to be in both the hearts and minds business um, right. in order right. to affect this kind of social change. Yeah, and, and certainly, too, this also connects with another point you make, which is the, the commitment to the conception of the human person, 
right, that has been present in Catholic theology for you know, a long time at this point and in the, you know, in the statements of the, of the popes themselves. We're going to turn to um, the questions from the audience now, and I remind everybody, if you do have a question, please just type it into the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your Zoom box. George, I'm just going to read uh, the question to you, okay? Uh, I haven't read it before. Um, I'll assume it's a good question, okay? The book Promise is a look at the different qualities of the next pope versus the introverted scholarly strengths of Benedict and the pastoral strengths of Francis. What are the strongest priestly qualities you see as necessary for the next pope? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I'll answer it in a way that connects that urgent question to another one. Uh, about two years ago, um, I was in Rome working uh, at the Synod on uh, evangelizing young people. And, and on the sidelines of that, I had a very lengthy conversation with a senior curial cardinal, uh, whom I have the highest uh, regard for. And he asked me, um, what are we looking for in, in a future pope? And I thought a minute, I said, a man who in his own person makes the truth of the gospel compelling and attractive and radiates both the joy of the gospel and the grace of God in his own life, thereby witnessing to the capacity of grace to sanctify the world. And we need somebody who's willing to fire 50 people in the first three weeks <laughs> to get to the point of Vatican reform. I mean, the first is absolutely crucial. Um, people, you know, the John Paul superstar stuff, you know, the fact that he, you know, that he was a celebrity, I mean, there's an element of truth in that, but the deeper truth is that he made people feel the presence of God in the world through him, and it wasn't about him. He wasn't saying, look at me, but he was allowing people to see the grace of God and work in him. I think that was especially uh, true in his priestly way of offering the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I mean, he was, if you saw that, you, he was in another zone. Mm. And he was in, in, in the pipeline <laughs> to uh, God's presence. In the world. And that really had a, a profound effect upon as for will, being willing to fire 50 people in the first three weeks, Pope might not necessarily have to do that himself, but he has to get somebody in there to do it for him. Yeah, there, is, yeah. there is a real problem of credibility in the Vatican today caused by financial and other sorts of scandals. So right. we need a, a holy man, uh, a hopeful holy man, who also has the shrewdness to know that he can't do everything and maybe somebody else is going to have to be the house cleaner but i will i the pope will give the house cleaner uh, all the backing he needs to do that yeah yeah excellent excellent thank you the next question um asks what area of the world do you see as the next mission territory for the next papacy and obviously it's like you said um, we already regard all the world as mission territory, right? But this question is really asking, in a sense, like, where do you see an urgent need of mission um, for the church, or an urgent opportunity, perhaps, to put it differently? Let me mention three, three things on that. Uh, the next pope has got to figure out how to re-evangelize Europe. Um, I, I do not share Belloc's view that the church is Europe and Europe is the church. Yeah. Um, that's a bit much. But th it is certainly the case that if Christianity continues to wither into inconsequence in Christianity's historic heartland, that is not good for anybody yeah. anyplace else. So that's, that's an urgent need. Um, I don't think Latin America has quite caught the new evangelization. 
And I think the next Pope is going to have to pick up on what Pope Francis did when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, his role in drafting this uh, 2007 statement of the Latin American bishops called the Aparecida document, which I mm -hmm. think is a marvelous statement of, you know, how to affect the new evangelization, but it just hasn't been implemented uh, very well. And there's a lot of old and stupid fights going on in Latin America of the sort we saw in the Amazonian Senate last fall that need to be just, you know, put on the back burner and let's right. get serious here. The other question, Joe, is China. Um, I believe that when the present Chinese regime, which I do not think is immortal, when that regime crumbles, as communist regimes eventually will, China will be the greatest field of Christian mission since the Europeans came to the Western Hemisphere in the, in the 16th century. Um, why is that the case? Because it's a completely open field. Uh, Mao Zedong and his successors have basically destroyed traditional religions in China. Um, there's nothing like India where you have this deep culturally transmitted yeah. Hinduism that, that's a challenge for Christian evangelization. It's completely open territory. And we should be figuring out now how that possibility shapes the church's approach to China, including the Vatican's approach to China. Yeah. My, my criticism of this present arrangement that has been made between the Vatican and China, which is actually being renegotiated as right. we speak, right. uh, is an evangelical criticism. When that great field of mission opens up, the, com the religious communities with comparative advantage are not going to be those who have been seen to be in cahoots with, with the old regime. Um, it's going to be those who have shown resistance, right. this increasingly, and I will use the word genocidal assault on, on certain religious groups in, in, in China. So those are three things that come to mind. Uh, yeah, and the third part of that question really actually answered um, the next question that was in line, which was about the role of the underground church in the future of Chinese Catholicism. And you, like I said, you, you basically answered it, that once the field opens up, that's really going to be the engine of, um, of you know, evangelization rather than the church that's um, implicated with the current government um, but at the minimum. It's important for Catholics in the United States who care about the church in China to realize that this is a, an extremely complicated situation. Uh, we're talking about uh, well over a billion people in China. Um, there are great regional differences in China. And there's a lot of gray area, particularly when you get outside of Beijing and Shanghai. There's a lot of gray area where it's not so clear as people might think, you know, what is Patriotic Catholic Association, sure. the Green Church, and, and what is what is what's what's the what's the underground or persecuted church. And people move back and forth here. I have no problem with attempts to uh, reconcile. Uh, these two broad categories of, of Catholics, but you don't do that by handing the Chinese Communist Party the authority to nominate bishops, even if you can veto the nominations. That's just bad ecclesiology. I'm sorry. It's also, a <laughs> you're, not, you're not you're not really sorry. You're no, not really sorry. <laughs> it's also a violation of Canon 355.7. One I'll leave that to I'll leave that I will leave that to, will leave that to <laughs> cat lawyers. Um, well, so uh, moving on, um, the next question asks, what, what aspects of the faith um, do you think that most, and we'll assume uh, the questioner means American Catholics, are, what are they most ignorant of and uh, should be the focus of magisterial teaching or clarification? It's, 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 a, it's a specific question, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a good one. Um, it is a good one. It is a very good one. 
I think the turning point to what I have called evangelical Catholicism, the Church of the New Evangelization, comes when people think less about the church and more about Jesus Christ. The church only exists because it is the mystical body of Christ. Friendship with the Lord Jesus, expressed sacramentally, lived in prayer, lived in the works of, of charity, uh, this is absolutely fundamental. And, and still within the Catholic Church, we're a lot more comfortable talking about the church mm -hmm. than about the Lord Jesus. So I think that's, that's a fundamental shift that needs to take place. I mean, read, read go back and reread the letters of St. Paul. This is a window into the first evangelization. He's not preaching the church. <laughs> you know, he's talking about Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we, we need to figure out how do we offer people the gift we've been given, which is that friendship with the incarnate Son of God. Um, beyond that, I would say uh, we need throughout the church a recatechesis of the creed. Um, you know, we, we say that on Sundays, how many of us really know and, and, and have our lives transformed by what we say when we say the Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life, or when we confess the communion of saints, or when we do those Christological formulas yes. uh, in the creed. What, what do we mean when we say uh, creator of all things, visible and invisible? Do we understand that that wasn't something that happened X number of billion years ago, but it involves God sustaining providential uh, crea crea creativity in the world today? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that, and and then I think my my friend Bishop Barron is quite right that in in doing that recatechesis of the creed, we we need to meet this claim, which apparently affects a lot of young people, that science has it all figured out, and because there is science, we don't need the church, we don't need Christianity, we don't need religious uh, faith. So those are some things that occur. Yeah, to some, to some extent, what you seem to be describing is we need, we need to somehow like um, create the conditions for a real confrontation with Christ. I mean, right? And, and what's interesting about that uh, it, for me, uh, and I'm, I hope for other people as well, is that's not how I thought about the faith for most of my life, right? I, you know, I thought of you know, the, the, the Jesus talk and the Christ talk as a Protestant right thing right and and we talk about the church um so i'm very sympathetic to what you're describing it certainly does seem like it's an absence um, and, and and but on the other hand uh, my, this is where my my question or like modification of this question would go is i also feel like maybe consequent to this but maybe as a maybe you know independent of all of, of this movement we're losing a sense of what the church is as well yeah, right, yeah. and 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 this is partly what you get to, George, in the book is our sense of episcopal authority, our sense of papal authority, um, of our relationship as lay people, of our mission or commission as lay people. Right, all of this just seems um, to be less tangible to us as, as a community. Uh, mm -hmm. The point at which the two come together is, of course, the Holy Eucharist. Uh, right, right, and I. Uh, what, last month, maybe in August, I published a couple of columns, my weekly Catholic press column, um, saying that let's take this weird pandemic time to recatechize the church on the meaning of the Eucharist. If these surveys are right, more than half of the Catholics in the United States, including those who actually have some regular sort of Catholic 
do not either understand or don't accept what the church right. says right. this is. Right. Right. This is not a symbol. Uh, this, is, this is the real Jesus Christ who is entering into our bodies, souls, through the vehicle of, of the Holy Eucharist. This is an enormous opportunity to connect the two, uh, the church and, and the Lord. And uh, we really need to, to take the catechetical function of preaching much more seriously. Uh, moral exhortation is fine, but the moral exhortation doesn't really make any sense without the catechetical foundation. Right. Uh, right. Without, without the creed, understood. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question. Do the clergy need to be evangelized? And if so, who's going to do it? Well, some do, uh, that's for sure. Um, I, I do think um, in, you know, in a time that's very, very difficult for, for many priests, it is important to stress just how many good priests there are in the church. Uh, the rotten apples have gotten a tremendous amount of attention, uh, but there are an awful lot of good priests out there and we need, we need to thank them for their service. Um, I think the greatest thing that can be done both in seminaries and in continuing clergy education to make priests, to help priests become fully a part of the new evangelization uh, is emphasis on preaching skills. Uh, most Catholics complain with some regularity right. at the quality of preaching in the church. And, you know, my, my good friend, Robert Wilkin, whom I'm sure you know, I do. For, former Lutheran, great patristic scholar, uh, entered full communion with the Catholic Church, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. And about five years in to his Catholic life, Robert said to me, I'm finally beginning to understand why Catholic preaching is so inadequate. I think that's the charitable world I used. I don't think he... Right. <laughs> he said, Lutheran pastors think of themselves primarily as teachers, and Catholic priests think of themselves primarily as dispensers of the sacraments. Hmm. Um, and until we get in seminary formation and in continuing clergy education, get those two things put together, that you are both a dispenser of the sacraments uh, and a teacher, which is to say a preacher, right. that's where your audience is. Uh, we're gonna continue to have this uh, lag in um, uh, certain parts of the presbyterate uh, in you know, pulling their oar in, in the new evangelization. Great, um, here's another question. What is the impact of loving Jesus on the lay couple from having children to taking care of their old parents. We need to talk about these tough issues as part of our evangelization, family and the reception of sacraments. So in a way, this is like a, you know, kind of nice broad cultural question, right, with regard to family, right, and the intergenerationality um, uh, of family life, right? Something that Pope Francis, of course, emphasizes quite a bit um, in his own work, right? That, yeah. um, Got a, got a take on this? What is the impact uh, of loving Jesus on this? About, a, about an hour ago, uh, an hour before we began this conversation, I got a, uh, an email with an attached memorial essay uh, talking about my, my dear friend, Father Paul Menkowski, who died uh, just about uh, 10 days ago. This is from a scripture professor um, at a seminary. Uh, who said that Paul had been his uh, spiritual director and that at their first get-together um, as director and directee, Father Minkowski had said to the guy, there are two things you got to do. You have to pray morning and evening prayer every day because it's good to have Iron Age words in your mouth twice a day. 
that, which was a classic Mankowski description of the song. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't know him. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I've, I've read so much about him. I wish I knew. Yeah. So you have to you have to pray morning and evening prayer every day because it's good to have the Iron Age in your mouth, and you have to go to confession regularly because because it helps you live in charity. Yeah, and I think that the last is really the answer to your to the query there. Um, uh, we need the grace of the sacrament of reconciliation uh, in order to live the challenges of, of parenthood with children, which are considerable, and uh, to live um, the, the imperative of care. Uh, for elderly parents and relatives. I mean, you, you, you can't do this without that, without that infusion of grace. So true. And if we, if we understood, as I suggest, I mean, I do suggest in the book, the next Pope, that one of the things the Pope could do about uh, lay apostolate and lay witness is urge people to return to the regular practice of confession because that's where we bring all of the problems of being missionary disciples, of being friends of the Lord Jesus right. to him uh, in order to uh, be re-energized for that challenge of, of living in charity uh, with, uh, with others. So um, I think that uh, that's worth pondering. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think this will be the last question, and in a way, it's a fitting um, final question. Uh, it's going exactly where you expect um, a question, you know, a, a concluding question to go. In view of the upcoming election, we're having a debate right now in America about the role of the magisterium and bishops in forming consciences, right? Some say the bishop, uh, excuse me, the pap papacy and bishops have no role in telling Americans have to, how to vote. Others say the papacy and the bishops do have a role and forming consciences entails discussing with the lady, lady how to vote. What do you think the next Pope should say or write to clarify the role of bishops in forming consciences, if anything at all? Should the, should the next Pope take on this question of conscience formation, um, I, 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 in particular in the, in the context of politics and voting? Uh, the, first, the first obligation of a bishop with a wayward Catholic politician uh, is not to denounce him or her publicly, it's to engage him or her privately. This is not done uh, with the frequency with which it should. In some cases where it has been done, it has not necessarily made a huge change in the politician's public position, but it has led them to stop presenting themselves as if they were faithful Catholics, including the reception of Holy Communion. Uh, I think the bishops have every right and, and indeed a duty to explain to the people of the church uh, the fundamental truths of, of the moral life as they apply to, to public life. Uh, political choice is always a prudential judgment. Uh, there are very rarely, if ever, uh, completely black and white uh, cut and dried choices in these matters. But we don't speak enough about the principles uh, and help lay Catholics form uh, conscience. And, and the Pope should certainly encourage uh, the bishops uh, to do that. I think if we concentrated as a church on that, instead of on these voter guides, which frankly, nobody really pays any attention to, uh, we would have a much more uh, well-informed Catholic populace making better prudential judgments. Great. Thank you very much, George. Thank you. Um, thanks to everybody who's joined us this evening. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your evening uh, to be with us. George, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And, you know, we're, we're grateful that you continue to be a friend of ours at the Institute and at Catholic University of America. Uh, best to you. Good night, everybody. Good night, George. Thanks very much.